Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the privilege of speaking with Kevin Feeney, PhD. Kevin is a cultural anthropologist and lawyer currently working as a program director and instructor in interdisciplinary studies, social sciences at Central Washington University. His primary research interests include examining legal and regulatory issues surrounding the religious and cultural use of psychoactive substances with an emphasis on peyote and ayahuasca, and exploring modern and traditional uses of Amanita muscaria with a specific focus on medicinal use and preparation practices. His research has been published in the International Journal of Drug Policy, the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, Human Organization, and Curar, among other books and journals. He is a current board member of the Cactus Conservation Institute, which is dedicated to the study and preservation of vulnerable cacti, and he is also a member of Shakruna's Council for the Protection of Sacred Plants. Now today, we're going to be diving deep into his newest book, Fly Agaric, a Compendium of History, Pharmacology, Mythology, and Exploration, and I'm excited to learn more about the mythos surrounding the infamous Amanita muscaria. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you, Darren. Thanks for having me here. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking about this book with you. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. And I have a feeling a ton of listeners are as well, because there are few mushrooms that capture the imagination more than Amanita muscaria. And I think your book has done a great job of collecting really worldwide reports and myths and condensing it into something that gives a, a great narrative. Uh, but before we dive into the book, I'm interested how you fell in love with Amanita, uh, how you, maybe how you got introduced to the world of mushrooms, uh, and kind of how you got to, to where you are today. Well, it started a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, as a teenager, someone curious about the world and different things that are going on, I probably had my first psychedelic experience around the age of 15 and experiences with psilocybin mushrooms shortly after that. And uh, my first experience was really kind of a, a life-changing experience for me. You know, as someone kind of dealing with teenage doldrums, I guess you might call it, and not really seeing a lot kind of interesting or, or positive in life. I, you know, I had this experience that kind of, you know, it kind of blew open a door for me and showed me that I world I was living in was, was really kind of closed off and I, I wasn't being open to different experiences and different things. And at that point started to develop a passion, particularly for psychoactive plants. And of course, mushrooms, fell into that category. As a teenager in the 90s, you know, this was kind of pre-internet. It wasn't that, you know, everybody had internet and anybody that did, you know, they had uh, AOL. <laughs> For anybody that remembers that, it took about 30 minutes to load a page. Right. So it wasn't really a great source of, of information. So if I wanted to find out anything, uh, I had to find something on, on my parents' bookshelf or go to the library or go down to our local bookstore. Uh, fortunately, I, I grew up outside Portland, and we had this wonderful bookstore called Powell's. Uh, anybody from the Portland area will know what I'm talking about. It's one of the biggest, greatest bookstores in the world. But anyway, I, my parents had been you know, mushroomers at some point it had gone out and picked and things like that, but we'd never done that growing up. Uh, but we had some field guides uh, laying around and I'd, I would peruse those and the M. Night Muscaria really jumped out at me and, you know, right away made those connections to, to, you know, all these sort of fairy tale imagery and things like that. And I also had the sense that if, if I was going to go out and try to find something, I was going to have better luck identifying an Ammonita muscaria than I was to identify any of the psilocybe species, which are a little bit harder to distinguish from other mushrooms. Right. Well, that's interesting because for a lot of people, the Amanita, Amanita, Amanita. Yeah. Uh, you say potato, I say potato. It's, you know, there's psilocybe or psilocybe, Ammonita or Amanita. Just kind of depends who you're talking to. 
And usually I'll swap between different pronunciations as I'm speaking to try to cover all bases. But that's interesting because most of the time the muscaria is relegated to kind of the poisonous column for most foragers or most people interested. I'm kind of surprised that early on for you, you recognize that as some kind of psychoactive because that, that's really not traditional. Right. Well, I was a teenager in the 90s, but also grew up with, you know, Nancy Reagan's just say no, <laughs> you know, and I had figured out pretty quickly that somebody calling something poisonous wasn't necessarily an accurate reflection of of reality. So as a teenager, it's something I just kind of took with a grain of salt, which is a little too bad because I, I think a lot of people did that because there was really a failure to distinguish from all that drug propaganda. There was a failure to distinguish between, you know, different substances. And, you know, uh, at that time, Nancy Reagan and cohorts were, you know, made it sound like marijuana was just as bad as, you know, heroin or methamphetamine. And there's not a lot of nuance there. (laughs) Right, right. Well, I guess when then did you have your first Amanita experience, if you will. Uh, And I only ask because I think for a lot of people, it's only once you get into mushrooms that you realize it isn't poisonous and there's a special preparation. And, you know, so I guess, how did you end up having your first experience and realizing the potential of of Amanita muscaria as something psychoactive? Right. Great question. So I had picked up a, a copy of High Times when I was 15 or 16 or so. And was flipping through the classifieds and there was this ad for amnidum muscaria and you know an assortment of other things uh hawaiian baby wood rose seeds and psilocybe spore prints things like that right and this was this company uh called jlf poisonous non-consumables i had an opportunity to interview mark d moeller in the book who ran jlf at that time so I, you know, ordered his catalog and with lots of different items in there, including the Ammonita muscaria, uh, different varieties from North America, as well as the Ammonita, the North American Ammonita pantherina, or some people call it Amera panthera. So I, I went ahead and, and ordered some of the pantherinas through this company and one of the problems was, you know, again, at that time, you know, no internet and really not a lot of good information on how to use these mushrooms. And the only standard uh, we had to go by was the uh, psilocybes, which, you know, typically among my peer group use between two and four grams of, of psilocybes. And that didn't end up being an adequate dose for working with the muscaria and and pantherina that I was able to get a hold of. So my first experiences were were very mild. There just wasn't the information there to figure out what to do. And and there was this messaging of poisonous and, you know, some indications that things could go awry in a way that might not be so pleasant. I was fairly cautious, but had some early experiences but it probably wasn't until later when I had more kind of in-depth experiences with it. But I'd say predominantly my experience has been within the realm of kind of the mild to moderate. And that has a lot to do with continued kind of problems with figuring out dosing and things like that uh, with these mushrooms. I don't know a mushroom that's more contentious in terms of when people describe what it does and what's, you know, some people say with appropriate parboiling, it's perfectly edible and delicious. Other people are convinced it's totally toxic. And I'm talking about even mushroom experts and foraging experts or, you know, oh yeah, you can have a psychedelic experience, but it's more like a delirium or a drunkenness. It's nothing that you want to actually have. Whereas your book kind of paints, and it sounds like your own personal experience, paints a a different picture and having not had any experience with it myself and knowing very few people that have actually had any kind of experience ingesting Amanita muscaria or Amanita panthrina, which I did not know was kind of in that same class as muscaria until I read your book. That's pretty hard to come by. Mm 
So I think a lot of this is is new information and I'm not advocating that anyone go out and have an experience, but it sounds like that's one of the it sounds like that's one of the only ways to know really what's the truth around this mushroom. Right. And I tried to avoid painting any sort of rosy or or romantic picture around it. There are certainly people that have amazing experiences they'll remember for a lifetime. And there are other people that have horrible experiences and they will also remember those experiences for a lifetime. So, you know, and this is kind of where a lot of these strong feelings come from when people argue about this mushroom and, and how safe is it and how toxic is it. And it's a little troublesome that it's led to a lot of misinformation. It's kind of fed into this kind of misunderstanding of the mushroom and it kind of retains this enigmatic status which is fine and but you know one of the points of the book was to kind of try to address some of the misconceptions that people have try to explore this mushroom in depth but also with a lot of breadth so i I wanted to cover a lot of areas and include lots of different kinds of stories about this mushroom and and different types of studies and and explorations of it to give people really kind of broad perspective and give people information with which they can make their own decisions. You know, some people might be interested in the psychoactive properties, but it can be prepared as an edible. It can be used as a medicinal, or it's just amazing to find in nature. You don't have to pick it at all, but you know, you can still have an appreciation for this mushroom. So it's not all about kind of this psychoactive experience, though that's what often people focus on, or they focus on the negative results that sometimes people experience. Well, and certainly in the mythology you dive into in the book, that's the central organizing force is the potential psychoactive experience. But what I also like is the book starts out with an analysis of the actual compounds. In that effort to kind of demystify what this mushroom is, you really examine those three primary compounds, ibutanic acid, muscimol, and muscarine. Uh, So what are those compounds and how do they then translate to effects in the human body? Right. So ibutanic acid and and muscimol are both isoxazole compounds. They work in the brain and in different systems than the classic psychedelics do, right? So your psilocybin and and LSD and TMT and things work primarily in the serotonergic systems. And uh, muscimol, which is the primary compound here, is a GABAergic compound. So it's affecting a different part of the brain. Consequently, the effects of it are quite different. Things like benzodiazepines and alcohol also work in the GABA system. And when you have people under the influence of the fly agaric, often people have unsteadiness or or lack of coordination. At really high doses, people can experience things like blackouts, which are certainly a concerning effect of the mushroom. But that's, you know, that has to do with where it's working in the brain. And so that's one of sort of the clear distinctions between psilocybin mushrooms and And just to kind of get back to this idea of these sort of negative connotations around it, part of that, I think, is that there's this large category of magic mushrooms. And I think a lot of people say, oh, this is a magic mushroom. And I've had magic mushrooms before, and I understand what's going to happen. But they're making assumptions that don't bear out. And uh, I think when you're not prepared for something or you have expectations that are incorrect, that can have a big impact on the type of experience somebody has. And it's important to understand the chemicals involved, not only to differentiate it from other magic mushrooms that one may know about, but there's a critical transformation process in the Amanita muscaria. And I think a lot of listeners who have some kind of familiarity with it understand those two compounds, ibutanic acid and muscimol. But there's actually that all-important transformation, which is highlighted so often in the stories of shamanic use and the mythologies. You know, you need a proper preparation to really have 
less of the the bad compound, if you will, and more of the potent psychoactive compound with less side effects. So what what's the transformation that needs to occur there? And, and what are some ways that people initiate that transformation? Right. So the two primary compounds that we're looking at, the psychoactive ones, are the ebotenic acid and muscimol. And ebotenic acid is a precursor, basically, to muscimol. Through a process called decarboxylation, it transforms into muscimol, which is actually about five to 10 times more potent than ebotenic acid. So in terms of dealing with things like potency, there is this sort of necessary step for people in figuring out how to decarboxylate the ebotenic acid to increase the muscimol content. So the easiest way for this to happen is simply through the dehydration drying of the mushroom. So this converts a significant portion of the ebotenic acid into the more potent uh, muscimol. So this is one of the things that's been interesting too. And and the book talks a lot about Gordon Wasson and his theories around Soma. And his book on Soma, which was released in the late 60s, really kind of blew open the door on Ammonite muscaria and generated a lot of interest in this mushroom. And Soma is the ancient sacrament that's described in the Rig Veda, which is an ancient holy book that was written, I think, two to 3,000 years ago or more in the Indus Valley in present day India and Pakistan. And Soma is both a a god and a plant and this beverage that is created from the plant. In the Rig Veda, which is a a collection of hymns, there's a process of preparation that's that's described. Right. So Wasson goes over this in in his book, and we offer some criticism and and re-examination of Wasson's theory in this current book. But one of the things he was criticized for of course, people that studied Vedic literature and culture weren't very pleased with Wasson and, and his work and his speculations about the use of this hallucinogenic mushroom in, in these ceremonies. So one of the criticisms that came up was that, well, if it's just a psychedelic mushroom, then why do they have to prepare it? You know, they could just eat it or consume it. But of course, the, the criticism fails because it it lacks an understanding of the chemistry of the mushroom, which actually requires several steps of preparation, the drying, which is just one part of that. Yeah. And that's that first celestial filter. This book did introduce me to Wasson's Soma work, which I thought was a fantastic base because, you know, it's something I had heard about, obviously, for any mycophile, they know Gordon Wasson for his work in Mexico with psilocybe. Mm-hmm. But it's really interesting to see how prolific he was because pretty much in every work in there that's subsequent to Wasson's work, it's referencing it somehow. So that's a really seminal work. So it's a great starting point. And yeah, I think that process of the filters when obviously I'm reading it through his lens and authors who are critiquing his work, but it seems to fit perfectly with the literature that's cited with these ideas of filters and the preparation of the Amanita. And then when you understand the chemistry, it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. So it is a very, I mean, one of the things that I appreciate about Wasson is, you know, I mean, this guy was a Wall Street banker. He's, you know, not, you know, he does not come from the world of of academia or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I never had the chance to meet him. It, It sounds like he was quite the character But one of the things I like about his work is that he really comes at the issue from multiple angles. He builds a strong foundation. He looks to different disciplines. And and if there's something he doesn't know, he finds somebody who does know and he brings in their expertise. And so he really created a, a multidisciplinary kind of theory. And he's inspired a lot of subsequent work. And a lot of the subsequent work, there's a lot of kind of derivative stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that just lacks the depth and the breadth of Wasson's work, which is why I think we still see him as kind of the seminal figure that is uh, referenced again and again when we talk about at least sort of religious and cultural uses of psychoactive mushrooms. 
But I think you guys really took it a step further by examining these filters. And we just talked about the sun being that first one. And then there's that second filter, which seems pretty obvious, that filter of, of wool or that actual particulate filtration. Mm -hmm. There was a study I did about 10 years ago sort of looking at at this aspect of the, the woolen filter. And my thought kind of building off of Wasson was, okay, so he has this critic who's saying, if they're like psilocybin mushrooms, you just eat them. So my thinking was, well, if there's these different steps of preparation, then there must be a reason for each of these steps to be made. I analyzed about uh, 500 different cases where people had reported in ingesting these mushrooms and you know of course there are problems with you can't ask people to to consume them and and then tell you what happens uh <laughs> so so i had to you know i had to scrounge around and find a number of different accounts and examine how people were preparing it how much they were taking what were the effects that they were experiencing and what i found basically was that people that made a tea or some sort of decoction or infusion of ammonite muscaria after drying it, those people had less incidence of nausea and vomiting, which are both potential symptoms that follow consuming these mushrooms. That their incidence went down in comparison to people that either ate the mushrooms raw, ate them dried, or they made a tea, but they also consumed the mushrooms as, as part of that tea. So my results mm. basically demonstrated that if you make this tea and you filter out the mushroom solids, there's something happening in that process that's reducing these symptoms that people would consider as, as toxic and are generally the reasons why people consider it a toxic or poisonous mushroom is because it can cause episodes of, of vomiting and, and nausea. So I thought that was really interesting. You know, you could clearly see, and these were statistically significant differences between the incidence of people getting sick and people not getting sick. So that's work that you actually did, you know, some rigor that you put into it to verify that the separation of liquid from flesh had right, a real right. purpose. And it's not clear yet exactly what the reason for that is, but it's it's a demonstrable right. difference in the type of preparation. And then going back to the Rig Veda, if this was a culture that, you know, the Soma was an integral part of their spiritual practice, ostensibly they would know that. They would know the most refined form to imbibe as a sacrament. So that would make sense. But then that third filter, I think it's a bit more contentious, uh, especially with Wasson's yeah, first Yeah, and I think hypothesis. this is the one that really... I mean, I think it did two things for Wasson. And, and briefly, I guess, before I discuss that, his third filter that Wasson proposed was the human body. So one of the things that uh, people discovered through traveling in Siberia, and a lot of these accounts go back, you know, several hundred years of explorers or soldiers who were either stationed or imprisoned out in Siberia, and who witnessed the use of this mushroom noticed that people that were using it would collect their urine and they would drink the urine and that actually consuming the urine would prolong the effects of the mushroom. So what we know now is that a lot of the ebotenic acid in particular and, and also some muscimol is passed through the urine. So then it can be recycled and re-ingested. So Wasson proposed that the human body was the third filter and that the purest form of soma uh, would be that which passed through the human body in the form of urine and that that would be the preferred beverage then would have passed through those three filters. So I'm talking about the two things this did for Wasson. One, I think it brought a lot of attention to his work. Because this is just this crazy right. idea, like what? This drug passes through the urine, people are drinking it. Certainly raises some eyebrows. Yeah, And I think it also upset a lot of people. And so I think 
it helped his work, but it also kind of hurt his work at the same time. And that idea has certainly survived in association with the Amanita, whether it's collecting urine recycling from a human or from a reindeer, even people who don't know much about mushrooms kind of have that association. And it's, you know, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I've seen, I don't know, at least a dozen Facebook groups that are dedicated to Amanita muscaria. They're new ones all the time. And I've, you know, seen these things of people getting blocked or shut down for talking about, you know, drinking urine. And it's not something that, that I've tried. I don't know that I would plan to do it, but urine is sterile. So it's not like... It's not as gross as it sounds. It's not as gross as it sounds, exactly. So there's a lot of this, I would say, sort of cultural bias about this. So there's this a lot of this sort of Western idea of, oh, this is disgusting. But, you know, people have different ideas. Cultures have different practices. And it's fine if people are disgusted by it. But, you know, it's not something that people should write off because it's not something that they're comfortable with. And he was sourcing that from the actual practice of Siberian tribes. Like you said, in World War II, there were different accounts that you guys reference in the book that support this. You know, when it comes to the chemistry, it doesn't sound like you are really getting the preferred version if mostly what you're saving is the ibutanic acid. And that's why, assuming that that's not really performing that all-important decarboxylation that you would want if you're trying to get that most purest form for any kind of psychoactive or ecstatic spiritual experience, and that's why the third filter you guys propose, I think, has a lot of uh, resonates really strongly. Right. And I, I mean, I think there's a, a couple things with with Lawson's filter is, you know, I think he proposed at one point that it was the urine was stronger somehow or, or more potent. And there doesn't seem to be anything that would support that. Yeah. You know, another idea was that it would maybe get rid of some of the toxic principles. Uh, a lot of people consider the ibotenic acid to be toxic. There's also some muscarin content, but there aren't really any studies to see what the presence of muscarin is in the urine. So I don't know if it's removed and not present in the urine or if it is similarly present as the other two compounds. But the other thing there too was that turns out that psilocin, which is one of the psychoactive psychedelic compounds in psilocybin mushrooms, is also present in the urine. Mescaline is also present in the urine. When Wasson was proposing this, he thought this was a property that was unique to Ammonitum muscaria, but it's not unique in that there are these other psychoactive compounds that could also potentially be recycled in this way. The difference is there, there's no sort of ethnographic records or accounts of any cultures using something like peyote or San Pedro and recycling the urine or, or using psilocybin mushrooms and recycling the urine. And, and a lot of that can have to do with the availability of these substances too. So if yes. something's rare, you might be more likely to save the urine. So moving on from that, our, and this is a, has a lot to do with the work of Trent Austin, who was my co-author on, on this chapter, and looking at ways to further uh, decarboxylate ebotenic acid and demuscimol in order to increase the potency of the final product or beverage. So one of the things that's found, the decarboxylation of ebotenic acid to demuscimol basically parallels processes that happen pharmacologically in the brain with different neurotransmitters. So glutamate, decarboxylates into GABA. And of course, you know, muscimol is active in the GABA system in the brain. Right. And there's a compound called glutamate decarboxylase, which basically catalyzes this decarboxylation process. So the idea was that if ebotenic acid is exposed to glutamate decarboxylase, would it have the same effect? Would it catalyze the decarboxylation of ebotenic acid to muscimol the same way that it catalyzes the decarboxylation of glutamate to GABA? So the interesting thing here is that glutamate decarboxylase is produced by various types of lactobacillus bacteria. 
And these are bacteria that are found in milk. Right. And of course, today we have all our milk is homogenized and treated and all the good bacteria, all the bacteria that makes uh, milk a healthy food is, is killed, is not there. <laughs> but, you know, 3000 years ago in the Indus Valley, when they're making this Soma beverage, that's what they're using. They're using milk that has not been pasteurized and it has all this good bacteria in it. And I should back up for a minute because I didn't mention the fact that in the hymns and the Rig Veda, that Soma is talked about being mixed with milk or milk curds constantly. It shows up again and again and again. And the connections that Wasson was making to urine, there are a couple of passages that could, with a lot of strain, could be interpreted in a way to support his contention. So milk really was a more obvious candidate for looking at this filter. And then there's a semantic kind of issue of, well, is it a filter if you're just adding to a beverage? Right. But if you think about a filter as something that is cleansing or is taking something out that you don't want, then I, I think it works because it is cleansing the final beverage it's converting that ebotonic acid, which does seem to be more likely to cause gastrointestinal disturbance and converting it into the more potent muscimol. Trent Austin ran an analysis on this using glutamate decarboxylase. And we found just an enormous level of conversion of ebotonic acid to muscimol, just an unbelievable degree of conversion. And now this was specifically with that decarboxylase, not the bacteria itself. Yeah. So this the study didn't use uh, lactobacillus bacteria. We kind of include that as a as a caveat in the right. book that working with kind of refined compound, we see really dramatic results. One of the things we would still want to look into is what does the conversion look like if you're just working with the raw materials? That would give you a much better idea of if this is a correct identification of Soma, it would give you a much better idea of what the final beverage looked like and how it worked for people back then. I mean, it's an incredibly strong sign that you're moving in the right direction when the derivative compound produced by these bacteria that are in raw milk has an incredible conversion potential to translate that ibutanic acid to muscovol. I mean, that sold me on it. And I wanted to point out that caveat of, yes, it's not the bacteria, the raw milk itself, but you can see the train of thought so obviously. And like you said, the third filter that Wasson proposes kind of relies on some passages that talk basically about the shaman being a personification of Indra. And you have to read it that way to really see it as kind of using the body to reset. So I didn't resonate as strongly with that. And then what you guys put forward with the actual data, I thought that was a really powerful argument. And I thought that added a lot of clarity to that issue. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Just got a call from Trent out of the blue one day. And, you know, he said, you know, I, I read this paper that you wrote on Soma a few years back. This is the one looking at the woolen filter. And he said, I've, I've been looking into this and I've got this idea and research I want to share with you. And so we started talking and this is one of the things that we came up with. So I was pretty excited uh, to be able to include this in the book. And, and I hope some other people will follow up on this research and, and we'll see where this takes us. Really groundbreaking stuff. And then it leads us beautifully when you start talking about the Rig Veda. That's one of the mythologies. And it then leads us beautifully down the road of examining the mythology and culture of the Amanita as it really moves across Eurasia all the way to Western Europe. Obviously, it's an entire book, so it'll be hard to cover it all in depth enough. But in general, what does that drift look like? And maybe we can start with, you know, where it probably originated this use and this kind of cult of the Amanita Muscaria, if you will. Right, right. There are lots of kind of interesting theories and thoughts about this. And the idea generally is that the, the Indo-Aryans and 
part of Wasson's theory was that these are people that migrated into the Indus Valley. And as they were migrating, they were bringing this sort of mushroom cult with them. Right. And bringing it into a valley that did not necessarily have the same sort of access to Ammonite and Muscaria as other parts of the world. So the idea was that they came in with this knowledge and they had to go, they had to travel to go get it. But the people that populated the Indus Valley are considered Indo-European peoples and the the Indo-Europeans are believed to have their origins somewhere around the Caucasus Mountains, which are kind of located between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea or between Ukraine, Kazakhstan in, in that area, kind of Central Europe, Asia area. Yeah. So people left this region in multiple directions. So some went this sort of southeasterly path uh, towards the Indus Valley and others went, you know, northwest up into Scandinavia, Central Europe. And so there's a sense of And it's, you know, a loose (laughs) sort of hypothesis. Right, right. But this idea that it's possible that the use of Ammonite and Muscaria may have come from this region of the Caucasus and that people leaving took that practice or tradition or knowledge of that mushroom with them where they went. We don't really have good information about historical uses of of ammonite and muscaria in europe so there's a lot of conjecture here right there's a lot of even among the sami people the indigenous people in northern scandinavia who have a long tradition of shamanism there are one or two mentions of use of ammonite and muscaria in the literature but they're really brief and there's not a lot of context. So it's really, it's hard to say much about it. Especially when you add that layer, which again, you discuss in the book where literature, whether it be from the Sami area, whether it be from Ireland and examples you get into, there were different layers of kind of persecution of different institutions and authorities. So they may not have been able to say things as literally or or is out in the open, and that makes it even harder to follow any kind of trail. Right. One of the things we see in a lot of these mythologies, there's often two sets of gods that are in conflict. So I won't necessarily say that one's bad or good, but there's this conflict. And one way that this is interpreted is that these are places that have experienced people immigrating into areas where people were already settled and that some of this conflict and tension arises in this mythology and these creations of, of these conflicting gods and powers. And with that, you can, of course, there's going to be conflicts of cultures and traditions, some practices that will, will disappear, be driven underground and others that will be sort of adopted and and shared. But we see this and like in the Rig Veda, we have the Devas and Asuras as different groups of gods. In the sort of Germanic and Nordic mythology, you have the the Asir and Vanir. And in Ireland and in the more sort of Celtic areas, you have the Danans and Fomorians as these groups that are in conflict. So there's some interesting sort of mythological kind of parallels and this idea of immigrating peoples and settled peoples in conflict. It even shows up later in the book in Mesoamerica as well. You get some of those similar themes. So just to point out that these kind of, you know, history always blurs the lines of migration and invasion and what peoples live where. And it's very hard to look back into the past and see exactly what the movements of different cultural groups were. And obviously when it's mythologized, it even gets harder to sometimes read through the layers. But that's probably why it's hard to find the exact path. But the fact that you do see very similar themes showing up, you know, with the Rig Veda, as we just outlined, 
and then you go to Siberia or you go to northern Scandinavia, and I believe the Sami even stretch throughout northern Russia, you see some of these same ritualized preparations and uses. And then you go to the British Isles, like Ireland, you guys talk about different mythologies that seem to indicate, again, you saw Amanita Muscaria, Germanic tribes that move into Scandinavia, share similar mythologies. This idea that they migrated from somewhere and all had these very similar stories, to me, has a lot of credence. And that's something we can talk about if, if it's definitely migration or if there's kind of a convergence going on. Yeah. So one of the things that's there's this anthropological concept of of diffusion, which is this idea of a cultural pattern or tradition that spreads through intercultural exchange. Right. Right. So it can be this idea that the Turks introduced coffee to Europe. Right. Right. Then people start drinking coffee. But you've got something like Ammonite muscaria, which is cosmopolitan to the Northern Hemisphere. So there's a possibility that the use of the mushroom diffused, right, from one culture to another and spread through cultural exchange. But the fact that it's prevalent throughout the Northern Hemisphere means that ritual practices associated with the mushroom could very likely just spring up independently. I mean, if this is a mushroom that occurs in the environment of human early civilization, I think anyone would be hard-pressed to argue that people would not notice this mushroom. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are then going to consume it or or whatnot, but people are going to be familiar with this mushroom if, if it's in their environment. So I don't think it's necessary to argue that there's cultural exchanges or or diffusion happening but there is this possibility of independent discovery as well as this possibility of sharing so we look at mesoamerica for example so far disconnected from europe or siberia right of course there's the beringian land bridge right 10,000 years ago that the people crossed over into north america but in mesoamerica it's very likely this use of Ammonite muscaria is discovered independently. Yeah. And I'd say in, in Mesoamerica, I think the evidence for Ammonite muscaria use is greater than it is in Europe. So in Europe, we've got a lot of interesting, highly suggestive mythological narratives and symbols and motifs that are highly suggestive of Ammonite muscaria. But in Mesoamerica, while we don't have any examples of modern use of the fly agaric in a shamanic way or or by curanderos of the region, we do have a lot of archaeological evidence where we see clear depictions of the Ammonite and Muscaria mushroom in various archaeological finds. And the depictions are such their depictions in a context that suggest some sort of ritual use or spiritual connection. And there's some great images in the book that really kind of better illustrate uh, what I'm trying to say than I can just kind of in conversation. Well, and we can call him Borhegi the Younger because it's a, an ethnomycologist and archaeologist that sounds like he's building off the work of his father uh-huh. in his writing. And yeah, the evidence he lays out in Mesoamerica is pretty compelling, and he gives us a good framework, actually, for examining artifacts and examining history. If you're trying to find some thread, you know, it's easy to sometimes make things fit in a narrative just based on form or shape. So he does a good job of going beyond, well, it's not just mushroom-shaped, you know, whether it's, he calls them, I think, killer details, you know, whether it's circles being embedded to emphasize warts on the mushroom cap, like you'd find on Amanita muscaria, whether it's in the naming of some of the gods that kind of relate back to the word wart. or There are some really clear-cut ideas there. And then he also adds that ecological layer with how important it is to examine what would be the ecology there and would you have host trees for the Amanita muscaria. And it's funny because 
later on you read that book and it made me start thinking of the prior chapters, which are more about Eurasia and Europe and how that is a really useful lens to go off of. It's not just the form you have to think about. Would the Amanita have grown there? And are there really details that emphasize, yes, this isn't just any mushroom. This is Amanita. Right. So it's Carl de Borhegi focuses on, on archaeology in Mesoamerica. But the killer details is, is Giorgio uh, Samarini talks oh, about okay. the killer details and really making sure that you have the adequate context for coming to the conclusion that something is a representative or is a representation of a psychoactive mushroom. I really like, uh, well, I like both chapters, but I really like Sam Marini's work because like I said earlier, a lot of the stuff that came, a lot of the research and writings that came in the wake of Wasson really were kind of like, oh, like this uses red and white in this color pattern. Like these people are using Ammonite muscaria or like <laughs> this thing is kind of roundish looking and, you know, it looks like a mushroom and <laughs> it's, it's so speculative. I mean, it can be entertaining to just kind of riff with a friend about, Oh, you know, look at all this stuff. But Sam Marini really goes deeper and he says, look, you can't just come down to, red and white color patterns. You've got to have these killer details. And by killer details, these are the details that leave no uncertainty about what the representation is. And I think he does a, a great job of, of outlining this argument. And I think it's a really important work in the sense that I feel that it pushes people, it pushes researchers to really think a little bit more critically about their arguments before they start coming to these conclusions that are based on on really weak kind of speculations. Yeah, anytime it's purely literary or mythology based, there's always this element of you're stretching some aspect of it. You're looking through a modern lens at what they might have meant. You know, we don't know exactly what the vernacular was of the time, what different inferences could be made in that culture. That is something I've always thought of for any of the work talking about Amanita Muscaria, because yeah, I want to get on the bandwagon of yes, Jesus was an Amanita. You know, <laughs> Santa Claus is an Amanita Muscaria distributing shaman. But, you know, when you take it at that next level of stringency, you start really weeding out, well, is this definitively Amanita or could this be just indicative? You know, when you talk about magic mead and things, could this just be indicative of any psychoactive, maybe an herb, maybe a. Um, but I, you know, I just invoke Santa Claus. And I shouldn't invoke it in this kind of casual way because there is some evidence there. And I think that's one of the big things people love to throw around with Amanita is, oh, do you know Santa Claus is, I've heard, a, a Mongolian shaman, a Siberian shaman. Where does Santa Claus fit into this cosmology? Is he an Amanita shaman? And where where does that come from? <laughs> and I I love the Santa Claus story. This is one of the ones that I, I just think is great. And uh, the stories are... They're fun. There are some clear parallels. You know, I'm not sure what it is. Some of the people that talk about this are trying to prove necessarily, but the parallels are kind of fun to look at. And Lawrence Millman writes a, a wonderful short chapter about Santa Claus and uh, details some of his travels in, in Siberia as well as in Lapland and Scandinavia. And he kind of talks about, you know, if you're looking for the ancestry or, or lineage of some of these aspects of Santa Claus, right? the flying reindeer or going down the chimney, things like that. There are some aspects that look like they have some connections or have some influence from this fly agaric use. But Santa Claus is such a ancient figure that has evolved over an extremely long period of time. And uh, Millman's kind of conclusion is that he's this conglomeration of, of a lot of different things. You know, a lot of people point out that the red and white color scheme, but it appears before Coca-Cola that Santa Claus wore either blue or, or green or, you know, things like that. Right. So we can't, one of the problems is we recognize Santa Claus now as this 21st or 20th century figure, 
that has a certain assortment of characteristics that are specific to our modern time period. Mm. So really, if, if you want to trace the connections to Ammonite and Muscaria, then you really have to go back and you have to understand the evolution of Santa Claus as this mythological figure. And you have to trace, well, when did these different suspect kind of features show up? And if they didn't all show up at the same time, which is what you would think if it's based on, you know, this mushroom, that all those characteristics that it's supposed to represent would be there all at once and not have been added over, you know, this period of hundreds of years. You would think the Ur Santa, if you will, you know, the original Santa would be very Amanita inspired. Right, right. And and so one of the problems that we encounter when people try to speculate or make claims about certain cultures or communities or certain historical practices is that we have to understand that everything everything is bound by time and place mm. right so if you go to the church in france and they've got adam and eve standing under this tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is a huge ammonite muscaria mushroom right. and you know you could say oh my god this is the answer this is all about mushrooms then you say well okay when was the mural painted? What community was it painted in? Who was it painted by? What are, you know, what are the practices of the people in that community? And, mm. you know, in all likelihood, they're the practices and beliefs, you know, you go 20 miles down the road, which at that time is going to take you a couple days <laughs> to go 20 <laughs> miles down the road. Right. They can be really different. You mm. know, so this idea that you can you can find an artifact in a particular time and place in history and somehow extrapolate, you know, a centuries long historical tradition of veneration or, or ritual use is pretty preposterous. Well, it's flexing some imagination muscles to be sure. Yeah. And it's a fun thing to do. And I understand it. And some of these things you, you see and you just go, wow where did this come from, right? But if there's no other puzzle pieces, then it's just that. It's just that one thing. And it's, you know, maybe they just had some, like, trippy painter guy who was like, I'm going to make this mad mural of this, you know, this stuff. You know, we just don't know without more context. Just thinking about how culture shifts, you know, important symbols in today's, I mean, our meme culture is so far accelerated, but to think how symbols and ideas and motifs shift so quickly in our culture gives you some kind of a pause to think, yeah, this maybe this is just a trippy painter guy. Maybe that was in vogue for a few years and people moved past it. But you definitely do see these motifs springing up in all these different areas. And one of the strongest areas is that area where a lot of people assume Santa Claus originated, which is Siberia. And I think probably the most powerful piece of evidence there may have been the work that Gary Linkoff did with the Salzmans mm -hmm. in exploring the Kamchatka, if I'm saying that right, Kam Kamchatka Peninsula and the modern day relics of an Amanita culture. Right. Lawrence Billman talks a little bit about where the sort of the appropriate origins are of, of Santa Claus and where to look for them. Right. But the travels of, of the Salzmans and Gary Linkoff, and there are quite a, I'm not sure how large the group was that went on these expeditions. They, they did two different expeditions in, in the mid 1990s to the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is the very far end of Siberia. And Sarah Palin might be able to see it from her porch. <laughs> it's that close to Alaska. Uh, <laughs> but they go recount their travels and looking for the shamanic use of Ammonite muscaria. And we know through all sorts of accounts from mostly from a couple hundred years ago that the use of this mushroom was prevalent in Siberia among a number of different indigenous groups of the area. So they go and they, they try to track down a shaman and they come very close we don't really know uh, at the end of the story. They do find a shaman 
but it's not clear what her, exactly what her relationship with the Amnita muscaria is. Right. But what they do find is they do find a lot of medicinal use of Amnita muscaria, particularly among the older generations. People using it, you know, essentially as a tonic. And I mean, there's these strange kinds of contradictions that reindeer herders and older people or women that are, you know, tanning leather, they'll eat dried fly agaric because it gives them energy. Right. And they can keep up with the reindeer or they can they can sit and tan leather and they can sew for, you know, hours and hours. And there are accounts of people carrying enormous weight on their back for long distances with the assistance of the fly agaric mushroom. So there's these pretty in- incredible accounts. And the other thing that I find interesting is it's, you know, it's not only does it give them energy, but it makes these mundane tasks a little bit more enjoyable, right? Right. Coffee gives me energy, but it doesn't make my mundane tasks any less mundane. So I I might need to change my stimulant. But then you also see that people use it as a sleep aid. And so you think, well, well, how does that work? It's giving them energy and helping them work. uh, But then it's also helping people with kind of insomnia and things like that. So there's kind of these contradictions in it but they find a lot of these kind of wonderful uses and talk to the locals and they find that the locals don't really want to talk about shamanism they seem to be open to talking about the fly agaric and ammonite muscaria but the shamanism is kind of a taboo topic and they talk about under the soviet rule you know these people were were murdered And we're looking at the mid nineties is right after the fall of the Soviet union. And so there's still this air of discomfort and and terror, I think. So some of the things that they were trying to find out, they weren't able to because of that, but they'd written up this wonderful account of their experiences and they've got some wonderful photos and I wish I had been there. Yes, I think we all wish we were on that legendary expedition, even if we had to wait, you know, for a helicopter for a day or whatever that was. They had to sit there in the snow waiting for a helicopter. But it offers a lot of tangible experiential trip reports, if you will, that tell us the effects of what this mushroom actually does from things like uh, certain objects being enlarged, feats of physical strength followed then by a torpor or a drowsiness where you'd fall asleep, ecstasy to prophetic visions. And for me, that was really important because later on, when you look at some of these myths, whether it be Scandinavian, whether it be Irish, when you're seeing the threads of, you know, potential Amanita muscaria use, the symbols take on more meaning when you understand, oh, that could be related to an actual effect, the Amanita muscaria has on the body. I think that's true. And I, this is a paper I wrote for another book. There's a book a few years ago, edited by John Rush called Entheogens and the Development of Culture. And I wrote this paper where I kind of outlined these distinctive features of the Ammonite Muscaria experience. It's sort of similar, the idea is similar to Sam Marini's killer details when looking at archaeological evidence, Mm -hmm. uh, but applying it to symbols and and narrative within mythology so these ideas of displays of feats of strength or these incredibly long periods of sleep or slumber accompanied by visions or the aspect of people salivating or spitting yes it's a big one and the the spit being the source of creation you know, these are all things that are effects of the mushroom that are distinct from the psilocybe cousins and set it apart. So when you're looking at reading mythology and there's a a lot of people that want to project, you know, mushrooms or psychedelics or other things and into different mythological symbols, which of course people are free to do, (laughs) but you know, you got to hang your hat on something. Yeah. And I think 
if you can draw together a constellation of effects that are symbolized and clearly represented within mythological tales that include the consumption of magic foods, then you can start to develop an interesting argument. Because some of the symbols that definitely seem to reference mushrooms, like having one eye or especially one leg, one mm -hmm. arm. It's funny how those show up across all these different cultures you look at. But to me, I think, okay, that could be any mushroom. You know, what distinguishes this from a psilocybe? And then some of the myths talk about the person wearing blue. So you think, oh, okay. So we have the form and the color, maybe that is psilocybe. Whereas in another, again, understanding the effects of Amanita, they talk about having one eye, one leg with hair on fire or with, you know, some fiery element. But you think, oh, right. the blood rushing to the head. Okay, that's the killer detail that makes me think, yeah, this could be Amanita. Right. And that can be sort of a, a double meaning if you're, you know, looking at the cap color and also looking at the effect of flushing in the face can be caused by the mushroom. So you, you can find sometimes things that work in multiple ways. And so from that very concrete example of, you know, physical examination of vestiges of a potential Amanita culture there in Siberia, you move to the Sami, the indigenous people in northern Scandinavia and northern Russia. To me, it seems similar to the Siberian shamans. One key difference that I believe Milman points out is the Sami are the ones with reindeer sleds. And so right. <laughs> they're the ones that are probably, if anyone, the most akin to where that came from in, in the Santa Claus legend. But then you move to the Germanic peoples of Scandinavia and they're not only do you have the mythos around Odin, who again has one eye, you have the mythos of Kvasir, yeah. and that's the idea of the gods spitting and creating this magical being full of knowledge. Yeah, so the, I mean, the parallels are just some wonderful parallels. You know, there's a Koryak legend of, you know, this great being using spit as a form of creation. And then we see that again in accounts of Wotan's wild hunt, where Spittle falls from the horse of Yggdrasil, which is Wotan's horse. And then you see these stories of the creation of the mead of inspiration, which includes kind of the mixing of, of spit and blood. So there's this interesting creation element that involves saliva. You know, there can be different explanations for that but when you have a, a magical food like the mead of inspiration you know these are things that suggest something with psychoactive property i mean when these things are connected with encounters with little people fairies or dwarves there's a clear indications that require us to look into the possibility that these are psychoactive foods. And then you have to think about, well, okay, where are these people located? Where are these stories come from? And what's the most likely candidate? And then you can start looking at these symbols. Well, spit is really important, right? And it comes up multiple times in the stories about the meat of inspiration, right? So Odin or Wotan sneaks into the mountain to steal the meat of inspiration from a giant and he swallows three vats of this stuff and then turns himself into an eagle and flies away right and in the story he drops some and it's not clear exactly what that means what that means yeah <laughs> so did he spit it up did he urinate it did, did something else you know urine we can go back to wasson's theory about his third filter we know that the urine is is potent there's some tradition there yeah right or if it spits we've got that muscarinic connection salivation being caused by muscarin and when he gets to where he's going he spits up you know the mead and so he can share it with the other gods so we have multiple points in these stories about odin and the meat of inspiration or poetry, where saliva plays an important role in the creation or regurgitation of this magical food. 
when you make that connection with Amanita muscaria, it makes so much more sense. You know, why would there be any kind of central interest on spit if it didn't have to do with some effect of a psychoactive? It's very hard to like not view things through the lens of Amanita muscaria when things start to fit like that. And it is a recurring theme across the cultures. And then when we're talking about Scandinavia, especially Germanic cultures, you know, there's the infamous story of the berserkers, which again, when you have this idea of the physiological effects of Amanita, this going between intense rage states to listless, sleepy states, that's found in the Scandinavian literature as well when you talk about the berserkers. Yeah. So I think the berserker theory is a speculative one, and a lot of people kind of poo poo it. Right. But I think, you know, the original theory uh, by Samuel Odman, which is included in the book from the 1700s. Yeah. And I, yeah. I wanted to include it because it's not. The only other place I know that it could be found is in Wasson's Soma book, which is really hard to find. You might be able to find a copy for, you know, $100 somewhere or something like that. I wanted to include another version of that so people could see what the original argument is instead of getting it from, you know, their friends on Facebook or, or whatever else. Where we all get it now. Yeah. Right. So it is a speculative theory, but... You know, this is also one that was immediately dismissed by Wasson. Mm. And it's not exactly clear why he dismisses it. He says, you know, there's no evidence of aggressive behavior after consuming the mushroom in, you know, in Siberia, even though there are accounts and he kind of chooses to ignore them. So I suspect when Wasson was was first writing about this, we were leading up to, you know, the war on drugs started under Richard Nixon and a period where people, you know, even going back to the 30s with Harry Anslinger, who was the guy who was really pivotal in demonizing marijuana. He found these stories about the, the hashishans who were supposedly assassins that smoke a bunch of hashish and then go kill people. There was this political moment in time where the politicians were trying to connect different substances to people becoming, developing a, a murderous frenzy. You don't want to put that connotation out there. Right. So, you know, I can only speculate as to why Wasson really sidestepped, you know, this theory without really engaging it. Part of it might be that he was cognizant of these political things that were developing. And it may also be that, I don't know, maybe out of a, a love for this mushroom, he didn't want it to be associated with, with certain types of behaviors or murder, to be frank. Right. <laughs> but I don't know that that's necessarily a fair reason in and of itself to dismiss the theory. I acknowledge that it's speculative, but I still think that there is enough there that it's worth discussing and examining. So I chose to include it in the book, but one, because there's this historical aspect to it. I mean, this is a theory that goes back 300 years yeah. and that people have been talking about for 300 years. So it's, from a historical standpoint, it's interesting, right? And you just added another aspect, you know, thinking of the time Wasson wrote this in. There's also the time that Odman wrote this in. And he even talks about the time that, you know, the Vikings were potentially using these substances, how they may have wanted to keep it secret. And this is something, again, that comes up multiple parts of the mythologies to protect the use from the profane or the uninitiated, to protect it from people that wouldn't like them using the mushroom. And then I thought of this other angle where potentially people who wrote about, you know, it's a lot of... Roman historians, a lot of people end up being sources for Viking culture, aside from just the mythologies. And even in the mythologies they wrote about themselves, the viciousness, the biting of the shields is one vivid depiction. They bite their own shields. That could have been exaggerated too. So maybe they weren't as completely vicious and almost inhuman as the writings may make them seem like. That was a really good example to me of how many layers of perspective go into really looking at something like that. 
Right. I mean, they, they've clearly entered the realm of mythology, but they also, it also seems to be clearly based on something that was happening. You know, these groups of warriors roaming together at that time. And then there are also these, you talked about when Snorri Sturluson, who's kind of the epic chronicler of Scandinavian and and Nordic mythology, talks about these berserkers having these kind of manic phases followed by just falling into deep sleep for long periods of time. And, And so these are physiological effects that clearly parallel the effects of Ammonite and Muscaria. When you look at, you know, Siberia and this idea of feats of strength of people carrying a hundred pounds on their back for, you know, 10 miles or whatever, you know, there's clearly a connection there. Yeah. And the other kind of connection is it's not the meat of inspiration, but the berserkers are Odin's warriors. That's where they fit in the cosmology. So then you have this connection to Odin, who is connected to the meat of inspiration. And of course, now I'm I'm starting to make a lot of connections. And as we go, it gets looser and looser and looser. But there are those connections that, that can be made. And do they lead anywhere? I don't know for sure. But I think there could be some further investigation into this area. So it's not something that... I think can be dismissed as easily as a lot of people want to dismiss it. I also, that there's enough to say that this is factual, that it happened. It's part of the mythology, the berserkers, it's part of the mythology, the Ammonite and Muscaria. We may never know if there's a true connection there. You know, a killer detail could be if they had warts on their helmets or on their shields or something. We don't find anything like that. But yeah, contextually, there seems to be something that kind of fits in when I read the book and some of these experiences from the Koryak people in Siberia, and even later on in the book of Mesoamerica, how according to archaeological evidence, the Amanita was very much linked with warfare there. It kind of was a direct rebuttal to some of the most compelling dismissals I had heard, which was basically, oh, the Amanita doesn't have this effect. You would never be able to fight anyone because you'd be so delirious. And so it was interesting for me to read that and think, huh, there's actually maybe more here than I, than I originally dismissed. And I guess just rounding out this trail, you know, as we move from all the way over to the easternmost parts of Eurasia, northeastern parts of that territory, moving across through Scandinavia, it was fascinating to hear about some of the stories from Ireland. Irish and Celtic mythology is inherently fascinating. But there was symbolism there that definitely seemed pretty compelling to the use of Amanita Muscaria. And that's a couple different angles, you know, both from the Druids and some of the Celtic lore there, and then stories like Ku Kulaind, if I'm saying that right. There is some pretty compelling evidence with a lot of these same themes. The chapter about Cthulhuand by Tom Kriglinger is a favorite, and I really like the way he really investigates this sort of epic Celtic hero who seems to be a parallel of the berserkers. You know, I don't know if there's a connection there, but he goes through these manic phases, but he also has these periods of, you know, long, deep sleep as well. And there's these other features of his warp spasm, as Riddlinger describes it, that are just kind of fascinating. And, you know, having a a primarily Irish background myself, I find myself kind of drawn to some of these different stories. And so one of the things that I enjoy about putting this book together is the ability to explore a lot of these different mythologies and and stories. I think the authors and contributors do a great job of, of engaging with the material And certainly, you know, some of it's more speculative than others, but I also think it's an opportunity to expose people to just some fantastic folklore and mythology. And whether the speculations and and theories bear out or not, there's just this wonderful content that I think is just fascinating in and of itself. 
that may be one of my biggest endorsements of the book is just the explorations of some of these mythos. And it's really a great exposure. I mean, for me personally, I had never heard of Kachuland, mm -hmm. and I had never really heard of this exploration of Bridget that uh, the very famous Peter McCoy, I'm sure anyone listening probably knows who Peter McCoy is, writes uh -huh. that article about Bridget, who I had never heard of. And there's a lot of compelling material. And, and she's actually an interesting example because throughout the mythologies, there's kind of this Sometimes it's a vacillation, but between someone as a seeker or as a king or as a shaman who imbibes the Amanita and is very connected with its use to then someone who is more a personification of the Amanita, who is the Amanita. And Bridget right. was definitely an example of that. I really love that too. And that was something that Peter's piece is, is a new piece. He wrote it for the book. And oh, wow. Bridget was it's something that had come up in other places that it's mentioned in the earlier chapter by Aaron Laurie and Timothy White, but they don't explore that too deeply. And so I, I really enjoyed reading Peter's piece and learning a lot about Bridget as, as saint and goddess and about her position within Irish culture and, and mythos. And as we were working on this, I, he was, you know, submitting drafts and I'm giving him feedback. I found out my cousin who, one of my cousins who lives in Portland, married an, an Irish man and they have an Irish pub in Portland and they were having a, a St. Bridget's Day celebration, you know, at the pub. And I was thinking, oh man, I want to go and, and be part of that. So that was a great opportunity for me as kind of the editor of this volume is I got an opportunity to work with a lot of amazing people and to hear new stories and, and new theories about Ammonite and Muscaria and, and to follow along with each of the contributors, different explorations. And I was just a great part of the experience for me. Yeah. And Peter also does a great job of talking about just the modern pagan culture and he kind of ties it in with modern times in a really interesting way. He makes us all want to celebrate, I think, St. Bridget's Day. And he's also a good example because he's referencing Lordy and White, he's referencing Wasson, of how much this is a work in progress. And as we learn more, you know, you're able to see these connections. Even as I was learning the different myths, I was thinking, oh, this talks about poetry and inspiration of poetry, which shows up through the Scandinavian, the Irish myths. Okay, now if I later read something down the line of another mythology and there's an inspiration of poetry, I might think, oh, this is related to Amadeus and Muscaria. So that was another one of my favorite parts of the book. And I'm kind of hinting at it as I'm trying to cover all these different examples is the common <laughs> themes that show up. And I think it kind of gives us all practice in examining some of these texts and seeing symbolized or even esoteric language where, you know, they're talking about an Amanita, but they're not saying even a mushroom. They're saying something else. In the example of the Druids, you know, they're talking about these hazelnuts, which if you know trees, I guess the hazelnut is very analogous to the birch. So it may have been a veiled reference. So I thought it was a great practice in just being able to read mythological texts, you know, just beyond the Joseph Campbell hero's journey kind of material to really start parsing through the language and learning more about it. And of course, I'm one who wants to now find mushrooms in everything, but I think it gave us some legitimate tools to do just that. I guess for you, what was the inspiration to even put this together? Part of it was, you know, there just hasn't been a lot of decent stuff written about the Ammonite and Muscaria. I mean, Wasson's book is great. Uh, Clark Heinrich wrote really a great, interesting book but it's been 20, 25 years. And some of the chapters have been published before. Timothy White used to publish a, a magazine called Shaman's Drum, a journal, uh, Shaman's Drum, mm. that stopped publishing maybe 10 or 15 years ago now. And some of the chapters come from that, and they're just obscure, and they're out of print, but they're just amazing, amazing pieces. And I just felt that there was, one, a, a lack of good literature on Ammonite and Muscaria. I felt there's a lot of 
misunderstanding about the mushroom. And so I felt there was really an opportunity to create something that was really kind of comprehensive that could give the reader a sense of all the different facets of this mushroom that are worthy of, of exploration. And I understand that there's a lot of kind of varied content in here. And some of it might seem weird <laughs> to people. <laughs> like I've got that the Lucky Mushroom children's story. But I just thought, wow, how fascinating. The Glückspiels. Yeah. So I did my best to do something that was comprehensive, that was interesting, and that also didn't seem to be just kind of random stuff put together. I, I wanted it to feel kind of complete and to give people an opportunity to explore the aspects of the mushroom and the mythos that they were interested in exploring and learning about. And I guess my ultimate hope is that this is something that can potentially inspire maybe future research and give people kind of a foundation in the fly agaric and an understanding of, of where future explorations or studies might go. And I said to you in an email, I think what it did for me was simultaneously catapulted me into this world of myth and the mystical with the Amanita, where I'm suddenly following this mushroom cult that either emerges or migrates between cultures. What are the hallmarks? Picking all that up. And then at the same time, it demystified the Amanita. And there is a lot of great research, both on the compounds, there's elements in there about foraging and looking for the Amanita. Obviously, you get into all the tree associations. There's even great information about the panther cap or the Amanita panthrina, which again, I didn't think of, I've always thought of it as a poisonous mushroom, stay away, but you really break down how that could be in this whole cosmology as, as well as an analog or something parallel to the muscaria, which I thought was really interesting. And there's even a whole section about diet, nutrition. So it's really hard to put, you know, one single label on this book. And as is clear with kind of my winding questions, trying to cover it all as a task, because it is such a wide breadth and really I think offers this incredibly balanced perspective and also keeps it interesting. It's not just rote science, although that is in there, but there are fairy tales in there as well. And there is a rigorous examination of myth. Yeah, I, I got to say, it was just a joy to read. Can't say enough how much I enjoyed the work about such an important mushroom. I appreciate it. And just briefly, you know, one of my other goals was, you know, I wanted something to produce something that would be, you know, it'd be, it would have the element of being scientific and, and having that rigor, but something that would also be readable and accessible. So, you know, a lot of stuff I've written is, you know, gets published in journals that, I don't know, maybe a dozen people read it or something. <laughs> and it's, you know, you can't find it or you got to pay some exorbitant subscription to something. And then the way the journal articles are are written is typically not very friendly or, or accessible to a general audience. So I wanted to do something that would meet kind of the interests in, of a wide audience, right? So there's stuff yeah. for people that have kind of a very kind of lay interest or general interest, but there's also enough in there that people who have studied this and are familiar with the pharmacology or other things can really dive in and dig out, you know, some new information and still be engaged at a higher level. Yeah, it's definitely got something in there for everybody. And I guess as you, the mastermind behind this work, who's really dug deep and examining all these manuscripts and what's your cosmology around Amanita Muscaria? I mean, you've hinted that you have this very balanced perspective, but do you believe there is a worldwide kind of Amanita Muscaria cult? Was it one of the organizing forces of human society what do, what do you think about Amanita muscaria? Maybe the future of the mushroom too. Yeah, I, I I don't really buy into you know the universal source of of religion sort of thing. I, humans are extremely complex beings, and I think substances like those found in Amanita muscaria or psilocybin mushrooms, I think they can catalyze a lot of things for people. But I also think that humans are just inherently 
resourceful and imaginative and amazing in a, in a lot of different ways. And I, I don't think there's one answer to where religion comes from or where spirituality comes from. I think there is a role for mushrooms like Ammonitum muscaria and psilocybe mushrooms. I think there's a role and I think there are certain cultures where certainly we see evidence of ritual use and these things being adopted into cultures and cosmologies. But I also think that just like mushrooms, I think these ideas and these associations may just pop up at you know various times and history and various places around the world. So, you know, I don't think there's necessarily a continuum that we can find or mushrooms at the origin of all religion or, or a specific religion. I, they pop up and they're mysterious and the role they play in our journey as humans and as cultural beings. I think there's still a lot to explore there and a lot to be understood. You know, I would say don't put all your mushrooms in one basket, but... <laughs> but I think there's a role there and I think it's worth exploring. Yeah. I mean, never discount the power of just the innate human imagination, ideas, archetypes, inspirations may pop up from the underworld like the mushroom, but not necessarily caused by the mushroom. There's so much more to the book we could get into from the infamous round heads of the Sahara that you get into probably the most famous archeological picture of a mushroom that, I think a lot of folks have seen it's that famous guy with the mushrooms all over his body with almost a b-shaped head oh yeah we get into that there's so many elements that you guys dive into is there anything i mean we covered a lot but is there anything you want to mention leave the listeners with a topic or anything else that that we need to mention before we wrap up i don't think there's anything specific you know i think there's a lot here there's a lot for people to disagree about and there's a lot to explore i hope people will enjoy it have fun with it and see what different directions they can go with some of these mythologies you know and i think a lot of people will have my reaction which is i immediately bought it as a gift for so many people i know because i want them to read it i want to have discussions and maybe arguments and conversations about the mushroom and the contents of this book. Uh, so I think it's one of the, for anybody who loves mushrooms in your life, it's one of the best gifts you could possibly get. And it's it's really a treasure. And I know this is a tough question to ask anyone who's just made something this big and, and seminal, uh, you know, is writing a book. But what's next? What are the future plans for you, Kevin? What, when's the next book coming out? Oh, goodness. That is a great question. I'll probably take a break for a while. But I'm, you know, I'm hoping, as I'm sure we're all hoping, that this pandemic will lift soon because I'd really love to get out and go on some forays with people and meet people and, and different mushroom conferences and and do some of that social stuff and meet people and talk to people and find out what they think. And I'm hoping I'll have a chance to do that in the next year. So keep them fingers crossed and we'll all get through this eventually. Yes, I definitely think so. And until then, we'll be trying to read this 600 page book on Amanita to pass the time. <laughs> I guess, where could people get the book? And then where could people find out more about you uh, and your work? Maybe contact you if they're particularly inspired or feel like they can contribute to research or anything like that. So the book is, it's available online. So it's not something that you're going to find at your local bookstore though I, I don't know how open local bookstores are uh, right. at this point. You know, I, I hate to say Amazon, <laughs> but but it's on right. Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble and, and probably other online booksellers as well. For myself, at this moment, I don't have my own web page. But for people who are interested in kind of research and academic papers and things like that, there is a website called ResearchGate. And it's a, a website where a lot of people who research all sorts of different things have web pages. 
I have a page up there. You can find my research on Ammonite and muscaria. I also have other research on legal issues regarding religious use of, of ayahuasca and on conservation issues uh, surrounding peyote and, and other things like that. So people have a general interest in, in psychoactive plants. I've got work that I've done and that can be found on, on ResearchGate. Uh, so that's probably my primary online presence at the moment. I'm also talking with Peter McCoy about potentially getting the book up on his website, which is Radical Mycology. I think it's radicalmycology.org. He's got a great organization. Uh, Peter's got a great book. So I've got to talk with him and, and maybe that'll be up there as well. His book, Radical Mycology, I think is the only mushroom book I have that's as thick as the Fly Agaric Compendium is. So definitely somehow appropriate that it's all associated. And obviously he contributed to the book. And I love that you guys are connected there because I think he is one of the leading voices in really mycology in general, but citizen mycology and the greater mycophile culture. So that's really exciting that you guys are going to be working together. And rounding into the three big questions I like to ask all my guests, you know, the first question I think we could have a very clear-cut answer, and I'm going to challenge you not to pick Amanita muscaria, but what is what is a mushroom that you love and why that you want to share with us? That's a hard question. <laughs> For any forager or someone who studies mushrooms, it's nigh impossible to pick between the millions of organisms out there. I guess I would say, and I'm, I'm going to give you the wrong name for it because the name has changed you know, it's kind of the the bane of mycology is the names of mushrooms are constantly changing. And I get stuck with the names that I learned. It was called Lepiota ricotis, which is the shaggy parasol. It's just a delicious, delicious mushroom. Uh, and it's fun to find and it's great in soups. It's one of my favorites. I haven't found it for a while, but uh, hopefully... <laughs> sometime in, in the near future that's a great one and then other ones i i really like the purple is one of my favorite colors so whenever i find deep velvety quaternarius they're just gorgeous yeah that's got to be one of the most stunning mushrooms uh, one of my favorites too i always take pictures of the gills god how many gill pictures do i have of that quaternarius yeah fantastic yeah. choices and then a more general question, you know, what has this relationship with fungi that you've developed given to you or brought to your life? And maybe that's some kind of like spiritual connection or perspective or, but what is that relationship with mushrooms and fungi given to you? That's a good question. Well, it certainly inspired the work on this book. And as certainly, I think I mentioned before, you know, as a teenager being just kind of disinterested and, and dissociated. And, you know, mushrooms is one of the things that really made me curious again. It, it made me curious about the world. You know, I was never a, a bad student in school, but suddenly there were things that I wanted to know, right? And that way it really kind of helped push me along and develop interests and help develop a deeper kind of engagement kind of with the world around me. And now it's just if I can get out in the woods by myself where I can have some kind of peace and quiet and find whatever it is that I find on the forest floor, it's great to have that solitude. And, and I also love to take my kids out and get them in the woods and, and get them interested in, in what's going on around there. So I think there's a lot of different ways that it's kind of impacted me and, and helped shape some of my own trajectory through through this human experience. And I think inspiring curiosity and wonder in a world that seems all too mundane is definitely a very powerful effect. And I think a lot of us felt felt that when you said that. I think it's done a lot of that for people who are otherwise a little disaffected. It's kind of created a new spark of inspiration, if you will. And then what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? And that could either be just surrounding the book that we talked about, but I know your work is really varied and touches a lot of different angles of psychoactive plants, but also anthropology. You know, what's the lasting impact that you hope to make with that body of work? 
That's a really big question. <laughs> so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can come up with a, a podcast part two. Yeah. One, I, you know, I, I just think the flag Eric is a great mushroom. It's fascinating. I feel a little sad that it has such a poor reputation that I don't think is deserved. And so I hope to, you know, in, inspire some interest and to create a new foundation of knowledge. You know, I see a lot of people online arguing about the same old kind of misinformation or, you know, <laughs> things like that. So, you know, hopefully help elevate some of the discussion, help the discussion evolve maybe a little bit further. Yes. But I also think the psychoactive and, and psychedelic plants are very interesting. I think they can play potentially an important role in people's lives. And with the caveat that these are not substances that one can just play with without a lot of thought and preparation. But I, I do think there's something there that's important. And, you know, from an environmental point of view, there's some important conservation issues too. So those are some of the things I'm interested about in terms of the peyote in North America, which is, is not endangered per se, but it's suffering a lot of environmental destruction. And, and that's threatening a lot of really beautiful traditions of indigenous peoples in North America. And I would like to help preserve not only the species, but also help people who have generations of their family and engaged in certain religious and spiritual traditions, help protect that for future generations of, you know, Native Americans and, and North America, and, and also the different groups such as Uicholis and, and Tarahumara in Mexico. And we're seeing a lot of problems, similar problems with ayahuasca in South America with the destruction of rainforest and also just the hyper commodification of ayahuasca, which has can have some really negative results on the people with traditional use. So connected to that, you know, one of the things that I say in this book is Ammonitum muscari is a cosmopolitan mushroom. This is this is for everybody, right? Yeah. And so I think as people become interested in these substances, I would encourage people to think about their choices of, of what they want to explore and where, and also think about the impacts that their choices may have on the environment or other peoples that, that may not have the same privileges as they do. So that's one of the things I think is great about the Ammonitum muscaria is that this is, it's everywhere. You can pick it. It doesn't, you're not going to destroy the environment by picking it. And if people are cautious and thoughtful, people can develop a great relationship, whether that's just through cooking in the kitchen or exploring some medicinal preparations, or if people want to, want to go further than that, I think there's a lot of ways to engage in, with this mushroom. And so I, I hope people will find the specialness and, and uniqueness of, of this particular fungus. Well, I certainly appreciate all the work you're doing in all those different aspects you know, highlighting the Amanita muscaria as a potential resource. You know, there were stories in the book about topical use as a me medicine, as a healing. Obviously, there's the psychotropic use. And as psychedelics become mainstream, I mean, let's face it, that's the renaissance that we're in right now is our society re-engaging with psychedelics in a way that doesn't just shove them in the dark corner, but we actually explore them. I appreciate you adding this element of understanding sustainability and environmental considerations because especially with ayahuasca, I met someone in the Santo Daime church who had first turned me on to that idea that, hey, this vine takes a long time to grow and doesn't grow everywhere. And we need to be careful with it. And as more and more of these cats out of the bag and people start using these substances, that is something we really have to think about. And so that's interesting to think that Amanita, if we start moving in that direction of exploring psychoactive substances more, Amanita may be a more sustainable avenue with all those caveats about responsible use, being safe, learning more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show. We covered a lot of information and I appreciate you adding really detailed analysis, really thought provoking ideas and answers. Uh, it's just been a, a pleasure to speak with you. So thank you so much for coming on the Mushroom Hour.
Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and to talk about all these different things and um, look forward to hearing more of your podcasts on the Mushroom Hour.